podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to this 1865 podcast special. Local Heroes is a new film which tells the story of how three working class lads from Nottingham went on to become heroes as they helped Nottingham Forest go from mid-table obscurity in the second division, now the championship, to first division champions and two-time European Cup winners under the management of the legendary Brian Clough. Set against the cultural backdrop of 1970s Britain, the film tells the stories of Viv Anderson, Tony Woodcock and Gary Bertels and how the trio overcame the odds to rise to the very top of the game, not only here in England, but also in Europe as well. This is Stephen and Jeremy's here with me. And I'm delighted to say that we're also joined by one of the trio, Viv Anderson. Viv, welcome to the 1865 podcast and thanks for joining us. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Be gentle with me. First of all, Viv, the the film then, Local Heroes, can you tell us how the film came about and what persuaded you to take part in it? Well, myself and Tony Woodcock were apprentices together and he he, he knows a a lad called John Warrington. We've been known over the years. And they talked about, after the uh, I Believe in Miracles film, they talked to one another uh, about this project, Local Heroes. So Tony sold it to me, and we sold it to Gary Bertels, and that's how we are now. We just thought, maybe a story to be told. I know it's about Nottingham Forest, it's about football, but about our three players from obscurity ended up achieving what they achieved. So that can apply to somebody in London, somebody in Africa, somebody wherever it may be. It's how you got to that point in the first place. In the first place. So hopefully it comes over like that, although it is intrinsically based in Nottingham where we have come where we were bought all brought up and bred. So but you could equate this to anywhere, I think. You you talk about your upbringing in Clifton and how did that upbringing shape you for your professional career and the, the things you achieved in football? Um I had to walk two hours to school every morning so that, that shaped you in all weathers. There was no buses, there was no dad's gonna take you in the car. It was uh you had to get there and get back. And your own means with obviously with friends and everything else. Remember at the time that Clifton Estate was the, the biggest council estate in Europe. So we had lots of friends and lots of people on the way. But weren't many black faces on that in that estate at that time. I think there was only me and another another family. But yeah, it shaped me in many respects, really. One of the lines in the film that stood out to me is uh where Gary Bertle says at the time this is, when uh, he's just broke into the team, into the first team, that if it didn't work out, he'd be happy just going back to being a carpet fitter in Long Eaton, which by a modern standard, you think you're, you're playing for the team that's just won the English league. Are you really happy to just go back to laying carpets if, if things don't work out? But even though you were all achieving incredible things on, on the football pitch and enjoying great success, it seems like all of you were very grounded still and conscious of where you'd come from. Is that how you felt at the time as well? Don't get me wrong. Gary used to say that all the time. I could easily go back to to, uh, to uh, carpet fitting. And we used to say, why don't you get lost and go back to tyre fitting then if you <laughs> like it that much? So we used to rib him all the time every time he mentions it when things didn't go quite well. So, yes, it was it was a little bit upbringing that we... Listen, we all came from the Young Elizabethan League, you know, which is still going to this day in Nottingham. It's like, like let me think... Walls End Boys Club, where you had Shearer, you had Carrick, you had some great players. And then you've got the Salford one, where it's uh, Fletcher Moss, where you've got Rashford, you've got uh, um, Jesse Lingard, you've got uh, Phil Foden. They all came through that system. So but they, they all, if they were the equivalent of us, they've just got to get in the first team and they've got to play in two back-to-back European Cup teams. And it does, just doesn't happen. It's a very unique story, I think, in that respect. And they came from the same city, you know, played in the team they supported, although I was a Man United fan, but that's got nothing to do with it. <laughs> but it is still, uh, I, I don't think it'll be a team. You look at the European Cup final, it's going to happen in a fortnight's time. I mean, Man City, there's only Foden from the city, I think, that I know is in the team. And you look at the Italian 
team. They're all from all over, I think. So it's very, very unique uh, position we were in at the time. Sure. No, it, it, it reminded me of that uh, that story uh, about Stuart Pearce advertising his electrician services when he joined the club. And uh, it just seemed that maybe uh, something about Forest being... Forest players being more grounded, perhaps because it's a yeah, it's a club with you know, with, with, with local roots, a provincial city that you know knows um, keeps people getting too far above themselves. The film's interspersed with a lot of uh, pop music, cultural references, along with local news headlines at the time, political references. Um, it seemed like a time of real social unrest, and I was born um, seventy seven, so I just missed out on, on on those years um but as local heroes were you conscious of the role that you played in giving the people of nottingham a, a real lift and, and bringing them together we were young lads who happened to have a bit of talent and uh was being fairly successful going back to your point i think the manager kept us grounded if anybody did you know he would not let you get out to come in big-headed or you've, you've won a game on Saturday and you wouldn't know if you're in the team the next Saturday because that's how he kept you on, on your your feet on the ground. So, yeah, it was... Um, and, and and the young rest at the time, I, I was I speaking to a couple of my mates only who went to the film and I said, I don't remember the the uh, the riots in in Nottingham at the time because we were so cocooned in playing football. We'd go for lunch and we'd come back home I mean, obviously, we'd see it on the telephone time, but it never, <clears throat> it never really registered with us that you talk about it throughout the day or with with your friends at football or whatever it may be. It was something that's happened at the time, but was was somewhere else and not really here. But clearly, it was all over the country at the time. But we were so focused on being footballers and trying to achieve. It was a uh, something that just was by the by. You mentioned sure. earlier about the youth teams that you played for in Nottingham. But just going back to the start of your Forest career, how did you end up being spotted in the first place and eventually making your way to Forest? You mentioned you were a Man United fan. So was there ever a, a chance that you could be signing for, for a club like Man United and the team you supported? Well, it's an interesting story, that, because I came, I went to Manchester United. I'd go from, say, 15 to 16 every school holiday. So I'd go up there, train for a week or whatever it may be, school holidays. Stayed with a lad called Johnny Aston's mum and dad, uh, who was in the team at the time. Um, and then we'd finish training and watch Best Lawn Charlton train on the next pitch. So it was like, fantastic. This is what football is all about. And then they said, after the year, said that, um, I don't think you're going to quite make it at Manchester United. So I went back to Nottingham. Uh, mum and dad said, you've got to get a job now. You've had your messing about for a year. You know, you've got to get a job. So I had a few interviews, different jobs. And then I ended up getting, being a, a silkscreen printer, uh, right in the centre of Nottingham, it was. Small firm. And uh, what is a silkscreen printer? If you have a look on back of the uh, lorries, it says flammable liquids. It was a sticker that we used, they used to make them. But I never got to that stage because I was really the tea boy, the gopher. I'd get the sandwiches at lunchtime and anything they wanted, really. So I was only there for about literally less than a month. And then Foy said, come and uh, play for our youth team. Because obviously they'd heard I'd play, gone to Manchester United and been there for a year. They'd come and play in our youth team. Went back and played in their youth team. Invited me back. Now I'm 17. And they said, we'll sign you. And I became apprentice with a couple of lads who were there uh, that was from Clifton, my a lad called Peter Wells, who ended up playing in the first team, who was a goalkeeper, and a, and a lad called Glenn Saunders, who played fullback. So um, I had two friends already there. Um, so, yeah, it was an interesting time. So Brian Clough arrived in 1975, um, but it's widely regarded uh, and well known that things didn't really take off until Peter Taylor joined him a year later. Just interested in what was it was like in that like interim between Clough joining and Taylor arriving. Was there a different feeling? Did you did you think you were going places? Well, for me, it was a nightmare because I played on the Saturday against Tottenham in the FA Cup tie. Uh, I think we drew one one, and I came off with cramp with ten minutes to go. I must have been eighteen, something like that, uh, seventeen, eighteen, and then. Uh, 
at the end of the game, the door burst open and Mr. Clough says, I am the new Nottingham Forest manager. Um, the travelling squad for the replay is on the board, just in the old way there. Have a look. And if you're on it, glad to see you. I go and look at it, who played on the Saturday and wasn't on it. So I go, well, the right is on the wall for me then. Obviously, he doesn't fancy me. And who was on it was Tony Woodcock, who wasn't even in the 18 or 20 of the squad on the Saturday. So... Uh, so he's thinking, well, somebody's obviously knows I'm, I can play here, so I'm going with the first team squad for the replay. End up that Tony ends up doing his shoes and doing menial tasks. He was nowhere near the nowhere near the subs bench or anything like that. But um, it was a learning curve for him. But for me, it was like, oh, that's me out the door. Then I have to look for another another team or another club. But uh, I'll work my way back in after a couple of weeks, I think. And then it takes a year before Peter Taylor arrives. And that's when it, it all starts to, certainly Forrest's rise really starts to happen at that point. And John McGovern, I remember in I Believe in Miracles, said it was almost like lit the touch paper and it all just started. Was it a real feeling that, right, here we go, this is now we're getting started and something's happening here? Um, John might have thought of it that way. We were just young lads who just wanted to be in the team. You know, so if we were in the team every week, we were delighted, you know. So uh, the older ones would have made a thought of that way. But we were thinking, look at the team sheet on Friday. Are we in it? We're in it. Great. That's brilliant. So <laughs> that was all we ever thought of. And the older lads, like, you know, as you say, John McGovern, John O'Hare, these sort of players, were saying, listen, this, is, this, this sounds good. We had some good players. You had John Robertson, who was there. I mean, you talk about the famous five, Ian Bowyer, myself, Tony Woodcock, uh, Martin O'Neill and Ian Bowie were there when he got there. So he had quite a nucleus of decent players that uh, turned out to be decent players. We never knew that at the time, but ended up being decent players and being the stalwarts of his of the journey. So, um, yeah, it was it, it was an interesting time. But John's got a different view on it because he was an older player. And, I mean, we just looked at the team sheet and just crossed our fingers and crossed our toes that we were on it. As Forrest started to become more successful and the trophies started to follow with the League Championship, the League Cup and then the European Cups, at the time, were you aware of the impact that you were having on the city and the history that you were creating as individuals and as a team? Or was it you were in that football bubble of, I'm just getting on with the job and like you say, team sheet on a Saturday, that's all I'm focused on? Absolutely, absolutely. Next game, who do we play? Who's their best players? What we need to do, and all the, it was all focused on the next game, the next game. And it's a cliche, but it's a fact, you know. And when you're that young, anyway, it's the next game, and am I, am I in the team? The next game, am I in the team? Until we got to, I mean, with the year we won the league, the only time we ever ever mentioned it, or none of the players mentioned it, but the manager mentioned it in April. I think I don't know who we beat, and he said, "I think you lot could win this," you know. And that's a, that's a, that's the first time anybody thought about actually winning the league. Um, so it was one of those, yeah. So it was very uh, each game at a time, every step at a time, small steps, and that's what it was really. It was nothing thinking, oh, five games ahead, we could do this and we could do. No, no, no. It was next game. Who is it? Who are we playing against? <laughs> And who's their best players? And what we got to do to make sure we don't lose or win or whatever it may be. And in the film, Kevin Keegan uh, it, it, it talks a bit about that team and, and how good a team you were, but how on paper, and we all know the game's not played on paper, you, man for man, you maybe you didn't look at the team and think there's a potential European Cup winning side. So what was it that made you know, that, that group such a formidable team that could take on and beat you know, the, the big, cl- the traditional Superpowers, Man or the, United, or the, or, or the the European champions at the time, Liverpool. I think yeah, I think a absolutely. lot of it was. A te- I think it was team spirit. You know, we had a great team spirit. We used to leave training. We'd all go together, have lunch. You know, sixteen, seventeen, have lunch together. And the and the rest, the the boys who had to pick the the kids off from school, they would go, and the younger lads would stay. We had a, a bond that for you know, for four or five years was unbreakable you know and as you say you look at individually on paper you know little fat lad on left wing you know we had he, uh, John O'Hare who couldn't run centre forward but held the ball up great John McGovern who'd been around Frank Clark who'd been around you know so 
Ian Bowyer, who'd been at Man City. You know, you look at the team, you're thinking, yeah, on paper, other people. I think that's what Liverpool did. They underestimated the team spirit that we had. I, mean, I think I remember Graeme Sooner saying th- something before the European Games, that the, something about, oh, I don't know what he actually said, but it was not nice about the about the Forest team. And then Cluffy brought it in and said, have you seen what they're saying about you? You know, so we had an unbelievable team spirit for four or five years, which was unbreakable. And uh, that's what built a success. Well, you've got to have talent as well, remember. We had a lot of talented players. I'm talking about the players I've just mentioned there. They all have gone on to play for the country, you know, so that's how good they were. So they weren't, they weren't just also rams. You're listening to 1865, the Nottingham Forest Podcast. And you as well went on to play for your country, of course, in November 1978, make your debut against Czechoslovakia and become England. It doesn't exist now. <laughs> it's all changed now, hasn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. That's how but, old I am. But the, the, the story, obviously, is that you become the first black player to represent England in a full international. And when you look back at your upbringing and your career up, up to that point, were you kind of reflecting on where you'd come from and, and the journey that you'd been on at that point and how it had taken you then to, to England recognition? Not really. All I was thinking about, don't make a fool of yourself. 80,000 people or 100,000 people at Wembley, make sure your first pass is a good pass. Make sure your first header is a good header. Make sure you get a good tackle in early on. All the basics that I had to do on a Saturday afternoon to make sure I could play to the level. So it's all about focused on doing the right things because my mum and dad, my dad was here, my mum was at home, but people, friends were at the game. It was all about, you know, history bit. Never came into your head. It was about, I'm playing for England now, and the Kevin Keegans and Trevor Bookins and all these great players. I'm going, well, just don't make a fool of yourself and don't embarrass yourself playing for your country. So it was all the basics I had to get right on the night because it was an absolute terrible pitch. I think one half of the pitch was was hard. And the other half of the pitch was soft. It was like, you wouldn't play it today. I had to wash rubbers in the first half and studs in the second half. The, games would ne- the game would never be played today. So, you know, it was a unique experience and a unique time. And I think as an achievement as well, a, a, a real cap in terms of your career up to that point and, and where you'd come from and mm-hmm. the rise that you'd had with Forrest and then taking that into the international stage as well. And I think that's quite an important story to look at in the context of the whole film as well and the idea of becoming a local hero. Yeah, yeah. A local hero is a bit strong. I think Tony <laughs> said that. They're not a hero. We were just lucky to be around at the right time and we had a bit of talent to get us to a level. I know, remember, it's a, it was hard work as well. It, it, you don't really touch on putting up on film, but when I was 17, I dislocated my kneecap and slapped my ligaments in a reserve team match. So you had to fight through that as well. I was three weeks in hospital. That's how serious it was. Luckily enough, the the, uh, the surgeon who did the operation was the best surgeon in the country, but happened to be our surgeon at Nottingham Forest. So it was, that's a bit of luck as well. And he used to take my x-rays around the world when he did seminars saying, you look at these x-rays, this, this, this boy is still playing professional fo- football today. So that's how... Uh, that's how, how good he was at his job and how fortunate it was for me that he was there at the time. So there's lots of, you know, everybody talks about all the good times that we had together and all the games we won, but you had bad times as well. That's what sport's about. Sometimes you, you've got to take the good with the bad. And uh, that certainly was a was a was obviously a desperate moment for me at the time because now, uh, bef- uh, before, that, that sort of injury would, would finish you as footballers. But I was lucky that the surgeon was really good and, did a fantastic job, and I've got now maybe a seven-inch scar on my knee that uh, now would be a two-inch scar. But uh, that's how, how the surgery's uh, progressed. And just finally, we'll come to the modern day and a mention for the current Forest team. Now, there's been quite a few parallels made between the rise of this Forest team and the rise that your Forest team had, yep. coming from almost obscurity in the second division, not really going anywhere, a quick rise up into the Premier League or Division One as it was then. Do you see or detect any Brian Clough traits in the current Forest boss, Steve Cooper, and what he's done to transform the club and get them where they are now? 
No, I'm a great admirer of Steve Cooper. Because when he came, what were they, fourth from bottom when he first came? Went on an unbelievable run and then got to Wembley and managed to win in the playoffs. He's done a fantastic job. Now, out of the 20-odd players that he was given at the start of the season and throughout the year, uh, how many of them were his choices? Uh, led to be uh, well, uh, oh, I'd like to know. I'd like to ask him that question. But to be thrown that many players at you at one time must be a hardship. I, I, for one minute, I can't. I, I wouldn't have thought he he wanted to get so many players in. But to manage to stay in the league is absolutely fantastic. It was unbelievable, really. Some of the some of the results. There. I said I did a I did an interview before the season started, and I said they have to make. Uh, a city ground, a fortress, because to go on the travels and win games away from home in the Premier League, it's very easy in the in the uh, Championship, but to win it in the Premier League is really, really difficult. So they have to make the city ground a real fortress, and it turned out to be the case because they won games at home. I went to the Crystal Palace game, um, and they missed the uh, Palace missed a penalty. They rode their luck a little bit at home, but they got results at home. Because the away form was disastrous. And I think Steve, if Steve Cooper was on the call today, he'd agree with you. So I think moving forward, they have to improve their away, the way results and carry and continue on uh, making the city ground a fortress. And who knows what he may be able to achieve. Um, to achieve what we achieved, remember, we got promoted and then went on to win the league, you know, which is very, very rare. Leicester did it. And everybody said, wow, what a great achievement. I said, it was a fantastic achievement. But now they've got to win the European Cup back to back. <laughs> and they know we're knocked out in the, in the group stages. So, you know, it's, it's not, I don't think it'll ever be done again. But having said that, I said, we, we everyone tends to forget that Nottingham Forest uh, a botched together team that everybody goes, well, you put them on paper, who are they? You know, they hold the record, not Liverpool. They held the record, 42 league games, half of one season. And half of another, and we said at the time that would never get beat. And then Arsenal come along, so you got to remember we had a group of players for four or five years were just unbeatable, unbeatable. I mean, the record said that uh, forty-two league games undefeated. You know, we just and it was not, it wasn't with uh, all the great pitchers like you see now and all the dossiers and all the teams. It was like we took training. We'd say to Jimmy Gordon, "Listen, we'll have a five aside today because he could trust us." on a Saturday, on a Wednesday, or whenever we played, that he knew what you'd get out of us. And that, that's a unique thing, really. And what do you make of the, the current crop of, of, of Forest players? I mean, there is a, a core of local lads in the team, along with all of the, the, the signings. What do, you, what do you make of the... Well, the I think it, it shone through in the last half a dozen or dozen games because the lads of Wall came back in the team... Uh, the other lad in midfield, what's his name? Um, Brian Ryan Yates. Yates, another local lad. Brennan came, was in and out the team, but in the last couple of games, but generally the last 12 games he was in. So I think they would have had an influence on the rest of the players who've come from all over the place saying, listen, this is Nottingham Forest. We need to keep this football club in this league. And hopefully, well, Joe, what, you just look at Wall's interview. He must have been a big influence in that dressing room, uh, in, instilling in the players. How how long have they been out of the league, the Premier League, and the, and and how they want to stay in it because they've, they've sampled what is it what it's like to be in the Premier League week in week out and getting all these fantastic clubs coming to the city ground every week. So he must have gone round and going even if they don't speak English. By, by that we need to stay in this game and we need to do this and we need to do that. And I think he's that sort of character and, and um, he's come across that way. But Yates is playing his part as well. He's a local lad that gets stuck in, and people people like him, and I like him as well. So, yeah, I think the combination of the, the local lads uh, instilling what's necessary for the foreign lads. Great stuff. We'll wrap it up there, Viv. Thank you for joining You're us. Welcome. It's been great chatting to you. You're welcome. And Local Heroes is out now on Blu-ray, DVD and digital. And that's including Amazon, Sky, Virgin and iTunes. Well worth a watch. And until next time, thanks for joining us.
Sports Social Podcast Network.